Bacopa Monieri and its uh, its uses for improving cognitive function. Will you tell us a bit about uh, your study that you did in 2002? Yep, sure. So Bacopa Monieri uh, or Brahmi is the term for it in Ayurvedic medicine. Um, you know, has been used for thousands of years as um, a memory tonic is a phrase sort of that's used. Um, it's a, a weed that sort of grows in waterways, um, you know, all around India. Um, I ran that study on it because I had a student who, um, was working in disability support, who was working with people with brain injuries and they were seeing it advertised, um, specifically by somebody with who had an acquired brain injury who was attributing their recovery to taking Brahmi uh, or Bacopa. Um, and they were asking her, you know, whether they should try taking it. And she sort of came along to me and asked if I knew anything about it. And I said, well, not really, but I've always been curious about some of these herbal things. And she sort of said, well, could we do a study? And so with her and a few other students, we ran that study with mm. the support of the company that were uh, producing the product. We approached them and they were happy to be involved and uh, supplied the product and um, also arranged for us to get a placebo. And um, the result was this, the paper that you're referring to where we did get an effect on memory. Mm -hmm. um, we tested a number of different cognitive functions and this is one of the things about the way in which these studies are done um, and the sort of statistical analysis that's done i'm not sure how much you understand about the hypothesis testing and the significance testing um how much i uh, understand about it yeah so all your listeners i guess but yeah exactly. um, and please say, the, keep it quite basic yeah yeah, so one of the things with these sorts of studies is that um, with traditional statistical testing of the results, um, we take an approach which basically evaluates um, more or less sort of the, the chance that these results that we've got actually are coming from um, a situation where really there is no effect, all right? So maybe that's the, the way to talk about it is it's basically saying what chance is there that the data that you've got has actually come from a situation where there is no effect. And if that chance is relatively low, we decide, okay, well, then that suggests that this effect is real. Right. Right. So if you test enough cognitive functions in the one study, then there's a likelihood that you will get one difference or more differences um, purely by accident when really there is no effect. It's just that by random chance, you've got what appears to be you know, an effect of the substance. Mm -hmm. So in this particular study of ours, you know, we did what's typically done of testing a number of different cognitive functions. And we did only get one or two significant effects, which does raise the possibility that that effect is just an accidental finding, right? And really there is no difference. Right. How many so, uh, cognitive functions did you test? Well, I think from memory, we tested about 10. Okay. So there was a reasonable chance, but actually probably more tests than that actually in that paper mm -hmm. so there was a reasonable chance that it was just accidental the right. one thing that gave me a bit more confidence about it though was that the one that came out being significant is mm -hmm. the one that i would have predicted as being most likely to show an effect based on the studies that had previously been done with rats mm. so of all the cognitive functions um you know the ones that uh, most closely map onto the sorts of manipulations and things that they look at with the rats, that particular one um, 
was the one that came out as being significant when most of the others didn't. And then, of course, over time, the other thing that you know builds confidence that it's a general, that it is a true effect, is that other people report studies that show the same effect on the same type of task or the same cognitive function. Right. Well, what's that effect? So in, this, in that case, it's actually the task I was referring to before yeah. where um, you are presented with a list of about 15 words to remember and then have to try and recall as many as you can once the list has been completed. Mm. And then the same list is presented again and you can attempt to recall it again. So generally, uh, a normal adult would be able to recall maybe five or six words on the first presentation. And then as the list is repeatedly presented and they try and recall it again, they add to their recall. You know, so that by the end of five or six presentations of the list, most adults would be getting close to all of the 15. So they might be getting 12 to 15 of the words correct. So uh, you learn through the repeated presentations. And that task is the one that in our study particularly showed an effect and has shown positive effects in other studies with Bacopa Moniera. And interestingly, it's also the task that seems to show an effect most consistently across the literature with all sorts of different substances. So um, of all the different things that I've seen people investigating memory function um, in different sorts of memory functions, different memory tasks, visual memory tasks, short term memory tasks. Um, this this task I'm talking about is called auditory verbal learning. Um, and it's regarded as a long term memory task. Um, because it involves this sort of learning over time and repeated presentation of the list. And then it's usually administered in a way that you do five presentations and recalls. And then 20 minutes later, you ask the person to recall the words again. And so it's a long term memory test at that point, particularly um, because you, know, you had no mention of this task for 20 minutes and often you've had them doing other cognitive tasks in between. And so if performance is better at that point, um, then that's an effect of long term memory. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the task that seems to most consistently show an effect across all the different um, nutritional interventions sorts of studies that I've been looking at. Mm. Um, what do you think that is? Well, I think it probably relates to what I was saying before that um, it draws on quite a wide range of areas in the brain. And I think that perhaps that it's just a little bit more sensitive than a lot of the other tasks as a consequence of that. Um, and effectively, it's just better able to pick up more subtle changes than mm. some of the other tasks. Mm. But it may be that it's specifically you know, linked to particular aspects. So for example, that task as a memory task draws on areas of the brain like the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is one area where we know where the brain generates new neurons. Mm -hmm. um, and so it may be that you know, with chronic supplementation, um, what you're doing is having some sort of impact on you know, the number of new neurons that are being created in the hippocampus. Right. So, you know, that would be a, a fairly specific effect linked to memory and, you know, wouldn't necessarily affect other cognitive tasks like attention um, or, um, you know, visual processing, for example, because they don't draw on the hippocampus to the same degree. Mm. How, transfer, how transferable are findings? Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that's always interesting. Um, in the study that of ours that you referred to, we recruited, we, we wanted to avoid people who had dementia. So we recruited people who were under 65 years of age, but um, sort of into the later middle age. Um, and we specifically tried to recruit people who felt their memory wasn't as good as it used to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and we asked them about their memory function, both before 
we started the study and after they'd been taking the Brahmi, so at the end of the study. And on those sort of more subjective measures of memory performance, we didn't really get an effect. So on the sort of what you might think of as your everyday memory function, um, people didn't feel that it had improved particularly, but they did better on the objective measure that I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, now that sort of disconnect there might be because a lot of people when they think about um, their memory function and whether their memory is very good or not are not really thinking about their ability to learn new information which is the sort of task that we were talking about right. um, what they're thinking of more I think often is um, two things in particular I think um, one is remembering things like people's names so people that they know um, you know and certainly I think everybody as they get older has this problem of seeing somebody who you know you know who that person is and you know quite well and yet we can recall other information but you can't recall their name right. um, and word finding difficulties is another one that sort of seems similar to that in you know you can't think of the word that you want you know that again that's a relatively common thing that seems to be uh, something that in, increases in frequency with age so those sorts of things about accessing information that's already in memory didn't appear to change in our study and the other thing that i think a lot of people think about in relation to their memory in the real world is about remembering to do things Mm -hmm. You know, so remembering that you have to pick up milk on the way home or, you know, that you have to make a doctor's appointment or take your medication, you know, those sorts of things. Right. Um, and again, that's a different sort of memory and it's not about storing new memories, you know, encoding and storing new information, which is the sort of task that we did show an improvement on. So the Brahmi studies, you know, suggest that you know, it might be helpful for students studying and trying to learn new things. Right. And I have had a couple of students actually anecdotally tell me that um, they took Brahmi when, particularly when they were doing uh, subjects that involved a lot of rote learning. So um, sort of learning neuroanatomical terms um, and things like that, where they felt that it benefited them but again that's just sort of anecdotal but it matches up with the experimental data around the type of task that we would expect them to mm. show some improvement on so the copomoniary is for learning and that memory functions related to that task. yes so it seems to be helpful in creating new memories for material but not necessarily for helping you retrieve information that is already stored in your memory somewhere right yeah that goes hand in hand with my anecdote as well i think you've uh, read it on uh, our blog uh, yes i had i had great results with bakop monieri for my uh, i'd say working memory uh, but also uh, the effect that you just talked about so learning uh, and and really yep recalling uh, information that I learned maybe a couple of hours ago or a couple of days ago. Yes, yeah, that's exactly the sort of thing that um, the experimental sort of evidence would line up with.